So guys, my name is Priyesh as you all know. So in today's video, we are starting part 3 of this lesson. So in case you have missed part 1 and part 2, the link will be given in the description. So now let's see what is Biodiversity Hotspot. What we're going to talk about right now is something called a Biodiversity Hotspot. How do you figure out what the places are on Earth that deserve our special focus, that deserve attention that they need to protect them for future generations? It's obvious that the Earth is in trouble, and we can't save the entire planet all at once. We need to have a focus. We can't do triage on an entire planet. We have limited resources. We have limited time. We're running out of time to protect many of these places. So what are the criteria that we use to try and figure out what those hotspots really are that need that special attention for protection? Back in 1988, ancient history to some of us, and in fact might be prehistory to others, there was a scientist by the name of Norman Myers who wrote a really important paper that analyzed different types of geological, climatological, and uniqueness criteria to come up with the concept of a hotspot. Scientists who looked at this problem decided eventually that there really were two main criteria that were going to lead to what Conservation International now recognizes as a biodiversity hotspot. One criterion was that there had to be at least 1,500 endemic species of plants. We'll get back to the idea of endemism in a moment. There also had to be an additional factor that made the area unique and deserving of our focus there had to be more than 70% of the original habitat already lost, which highlighted the need to designate this place as a hotspot. Well, why plants? Well, plants, particularly in terrestrial environments, are crucial. Animals go where the plants are. Plants are the primary producers. They're at the base of food webs. Life attracts other life, and it depends on other life. Now let's get back to that idea of endemism. An endemic species is a species that's found in a certain area and nowhere else on Earth. In other words, endemism is a measure of how unique and irreplaceable something is. An example of an endemic organism that resonates with people, people love tortoises. If you think about the Galapagos Islands, for example, most islands have their own special type of tortoise. It lives there, and nowhere else. So if something happens to wipe out the tortoises on that island, those tortoises are gone forever. They're not found anyplace else. They were irreplaceable. At the moment, Conservation International formally recognizes 34 biodiversity hotspot areas on Earth. The interesting thing about this is that less than 3% of the Earth's land surface area is represented by these hotspots. So we're talking about some very, very special places indeed. There are other ways to think about these special places on Earth besides hotspots. Some of these concepts are used to help recognize larger geographical units of land and water that have unique assemblages of species or distinct environmental conditions that make them worthy of our special attention. I think it's really important that we recognize that the hotspot idea is much more than a conservation tool. It's actually become a powerful scientific tool. Because hotspots are a blood pressure cuff for planet Earth. You can go back and keep measuring the effects on these different places due to human activity or environmental change of various kinds and go through the science of measuring the pressure on biodiversity. In a sense, Hotspots are almost like avatars. 
They're like representatives for other endangered areas on the planet that might not necessarily meet the special criteria of 1,500 endemic species of plants and more than 70% of the original habitat loss. And yet, they are still obviously critical and important places for lots of organisms to live. You need to think about hotspots as a network of places on Earth that are interconnected, not just single units that protect small pieces of biodiversity, but that help preserve biodiversity in a great many other habitats and other hotspots as well. And lots of conservation organizations, government agencies, and even concerned people like all of us can use these hotspots to better help direct the resources to the places that require our greatest attention. Above all, we need to remember one overriding principle, that we focus on protecting the highest number of species that we can, especially the ones that are most threatened. That's what this hotspot concept is trying to get to. We want to enhance our ability to protect species richness. That way, we can boost the stability and resilience of ecosystems. So I think that for me, these hotspots really do carry that special signal and are really worthy of the special effort that's been developed over the last few decades to monitor them, to provide the good, solid science that helps us not just to define them, but to monitor and promote their health down the road and to employ those concepts to draw people in to develop that people power that's really necessary to move forward with the protection of life on Earth. So now let's see which species are endangered. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, UCAN, are the main authority for the conservation status of the world's organisms. They're the ones who are responsible basically for saying, yo, this thing's almost done, please stop killing it, which is a cool thing. The thing is, only species that have had populations have been evaluated, that is, there are enough of a population that we can regularly study them are listed. Some creatures, like the goblin shark and other deep sea fish, are so seldom seen that we have no effective or accurate way to gauge how fucked they are. A thing most people don't grasp is there are different levels of oh fuck, aside from just flat out endangered. Not just animals are evaluated by the IUCN, but plants as well. Also four species of fungi and protists, for... sub... reason. Let's take a wonderful journey through the world of overkilling and natural selection, shall we? The lowest level of this shit is really not official and really just a side thing, it's domesticated animals. The odds of chickens and cows suddenly going extinct are pretty slim, and if it happens to them, then what the fuck is going on with our species? I mean, shit, fuck the chickens. Moving on! LC, least concern. Least concerned species are fucking alright. Punch them, eat them all you want. Their species is probably going to be fine. Ain't nothing too interesting about these. Let's move on. NT. Near threatened. Species that are near threatened are ones that may be threatened in the near future but aren't currently. Depending on what happens in the future, their numbers could drop faster than a sack of batteries, but we'll see. Still probably okay to punch, eat if your conscience can allow it. The last of the lower risk classifications are species whose status is conservation dependent. These are species that have some sort of program focused on their conservation specifically. If these programs were dropped, they'd end up in one of the higher categories. Currently, there are 300 species with this classification, 46 animals, 254 plants. Only mammals have their population regularly gauged here for some reason, and only the southern right whale's population is steadily increasing. Try not to punch these that often. Now we're getting into the threatened classes. These are ones I wouldn't punch unless you wanted to punch something that's probably a limited time offer. Vulnerable is the lowest level of threatenedness. Vulnerable species are generally vulnerable due to habitat loss. These are organisms that aren't quite endangered, but they're getting there. There's a weird quirk of these threatened levels that though they can be rare in the wild, they're incredibly common in captivity. The Venus flytrap's wild habitat, the swamps of the Carolinas, is getting fucked up, but they're an incredibly common plant you can purchase at many garden centers. Go figure. Now these are the big ones that people care about. Endangered species. An endangered species is a species that is at risk of becoming extinct either due to its numbers dropping too low or some other threat like a predator being introduced that's just obliterating the population. In the United States, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Marine Fisheries Service are responsible for classifying federally recognized endangered species. But adding a thing to the list is long and for some goddamn reason controversial. 
The known species threatened with extinction federally by the United States are ten times higher than the actual number protected under the Endangered Species Act. Critically endangered species are oh god, oh god, fuck, fuck. These are species whose population has or will decrease by 80% within three generations. These are animals that are probably fucked, like our dwarf sawfish friend. However, again, this is a weird case where one can be incredibly common in captivity. Wild axolotls are critically endangered as their habitat around Mexico City is pretty fucked. But they are a common and popular pet around the world. Zorak even has some. How weird. Now we're getting to the really bad ones. EW, extinct in the wild. These are species who only exist within captivity or as naturalized populations outside of their home range. This isn't just rare shit, to be fair. Several aquarium fish that are common are extinct in the wild but can be purchased for a nickel. The biggest example of a species being extinct in the wild is the Pinta Island tortoise, a subspecies of the Galapagos tortoise. Only one of this species, named Lonesome George at the Prague Zoo, remains in existence. He is what is known as an endling. When Lonesome George departs from this mortal coil, his species will be extinct. Finally, the last level is extinction. Which, well, you know what that means. There are no more. The species is dead. Done. Gone forever. Barring Lazarus taxons like our silicant friend, but that's another story. Has to be said, the not all species are vulnerable to extinction thanks to human causes. Some species just don't survive. This is a natural thing that's been happening since life itself began. Species disappear from existence, never to be punched again. While other species emerge, primed and ready for a good beat. So guys, this video will be the end of this lesson. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will be soon uploading the next video. So stay tuned for that and subscribe my channel. So that's it for today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for more such videos and peace out.